Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm not uh, a normal speaker. I'm a researcher and have been for about 25 years on researching uh, various things, uh, genealogical uh, research, um, skip tracing, all different kinds of research. So I've had my hand in getting hold of government records for a long time. Um, what we're going to be doing, first of all, as he said, is to watch two videos. Both of them were produced by Catherine Cryer of Cryer Wire on Court TV News. And she did a wonderful overview um, of the um, problems that have happened since 2000. The first one is called Defending Democracy 1, and the second is Defending Our Democracy 2. And um, the first one is going to tell us about what happened between 2000 and 2004, and the second will bring us up from 2004 up to date, right up through the Bill, B, Bill Bray Busby race in California that you probably have all heard about with the uh, machine sleepovers. And um, so, so she does a wonderful job of doing that. But before we get into watching the videos, I want to tell you um, about the three warning signs that I, that I feel um, are, are red flags for, for a declining democracy. And uh, they have to do with, um, well, these particular red flags have to do with, with election officials. When they tell you to trust me, would be a big flag. You don't want to have our elections um, ever have to uh, be, you know, be, be um, uh, turned over to an official and, and, and just have them say, trust me. Uh, the second um, thing that you don't want to have happen is for um, them to say, well, look, you're destroying our, the public confidence. No, you can't call for public confidence in a system or a process or even elections. It has to be earned. And the third thing is, when you start to see the process become less open, less transparent, when records are being denied to the public, um, especially election records when they want to see poll books, register books, tapes from the machines that can either prove um, you know, failure or, or help in a recount effort. Uh, I'm seeing more and more, or, or less and less openness as far as this goes. About three years ago, I started to uh, do a lot of election records requests here in the state of Utah. And at this point, when I go to do a records request, it comes in very slow, if it comes in at all. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm uh, in the process of uh, an appeal with the Lieutenant Governor's Office over denial of... Um, the voter registration database. It's at the State Records Committee right now, and I believe it's coming up three days after Bruce's appeal is going to be heard. So I'll tell you a little about that if we have some time. <clears throat> but right now, so when we, we're going to watch the first video, so keep those things in mind. You'll, you'll hear either election officials or um, Catherine Cryer speak to um, an official saying, trust me, or um, you know, we need public confidence in the system or denial of records. Um, and sometimes that denial can come in the form of uh, exorbitant prices for records uh, or, or denying the records um, and you don't get them in time in order to follow the laws to ask for a recount. And, and this is, in fact, what happened in the Busby Bill Bray race, uh, a public citizen who wanted to um, contest that count and ask for a recount was effectively denied these records. There is no punishment for uh, election officials uh, when, they, when they deny or don't give the records to you. There needs to be fines across the United States, especially in something that is as important as our elections when we can't access those records. They need to feel it in their pocketbook or in their office's pocketbooks if the public is denied access to the very essence of our democracy. Could I have you start video number one, please? It is a democracy and freedom that bring true security and prosperity in every land. The only path to true progress is the path of freedom and justice and democracy. The terrorists are doing all they can to stop the rise of a free Iraq. But their bombs and attacks have
have not prevented Iraqi sovereignty, and they will not prevent Iraqi democracy. Remember how important the Iraqi election was and how proud the citizens were that their vote finally counted? The question tonight, does your still matter? New reports allege that voter fraud is exploding here at home, right under the nose of the world's largest news media. Earlier this month, Rolling Stone magazine published an expose by Robert Kennedy Jr. called, Was the 2004 Election Stolen? The article was met with a collective sneeze from the mainstream press. Seems that nothing kills a story about Republican corruption like a Kennedy byline. So what about Kennedy's charges? I submit to you that the evidence of a full frontal attack on democracy was staring us in the face long before Kennedy's article. It is my duty under Florida law to exercise my discretion in denying these requested amendments. Six years do not make this decision any less notorious. In 2000, in an election too close to call, Florida Secretary of State Catherine Harris used her discretion to rule on the side of a deadline rather than the thousands of voters she was charged to protect. Subsequent investigations have found that had she allowed these votes to be counted, Al Gore may well have won the presidency. For her discretion, Harris won GOP support for a seat in Congress. With her lackluster performance and an ethics probe, now the Republicans want her to abandon her race for the Senate. Her own campaign manager, Ed Rollins, quit her, saying, every time I turned over a rock, I found out something I didn't want to know. The presidency couldn't have come any cheaper. Fast forward to 2004. The state of Ohio decides the presidency by only 187,000 votes. Kennedy says 357,000 votes were not even counted or disqualified before the fact. Kennedy's evidence finds that one out of every four Ohio citizens showed up at their polling place only to be turned away by improper registrations or long lines. Is this not an attack on democracy? If 357,000 Americans were killed by al-Qaeda, we would call that an attack on democracy and freedom. The press would headline such an event, and it would shape our policies for decades to come. In a democracy, when 357,000 votes are effectively killed at the voting booth, what do you call it? Well, meet the new Catherine Harris, Ohio Secretary of State Kenneth Blackwell. He's ambitious, and he toes the party line absolutely. Not only is he in charge of all elections in Ohio, he was simultaneously the Ohio chairman of President Bush's 2004 campaign. Whether it was the purging of voter rolls, the lack of machines in Democratic districts, or the weight of incomprehensible regulations to limit registration, many point to his work as the source of problems on Election Day 2004. Former President Jimmy Carter has monitored elections all over the world. I asked him about the obvious conflict of interest. How can you be a co-chair of a particular candidate's campaign and be in charge of monitoring the you election? You, you can be in charge of it, but you can't be trusted mm -hmm. if the election goes the other way. <laughs> uh, the idea seemed funny at the time, but then I thought, is this democracy? Moving on, meet James Tobin. In 2004, he was New England Regional Chairman of the Bush-Cheney campaign. Today, he is fighting to keep himself out of jail. You see, on Election Day 2004, Mr. Tobin used a telemarketing firm to jam phone service at a Democratic call center. The center's mission was to get out the vote. The mission was sabotaged. Mr. Tobin made numerous calls to the White House on that very day and the day after and was convicted of two counts of telephone harassment. He's now appealing his 10-month prison sentence. Republican Party Chairman Ken Melman said those calls to the White House had nothing to do with the phone jamming scheme. Well, I feel better already. But is this democracy? So what's next? These are faulty electoral process becomes even faultier thanks to the latest technology and R2-D2 over there. Uh, computer analysts have found that many of the latest voting machines are highly hackable. Well, I guess that's the new high-tech approach in this war on democracy. The most popular of these, made by Diebold, have come under particular scrutiny, made worse by the company's CEO, who said in a 2004 Republican fundraising letter that he is, quote, committed to helping Ohio deliver its electoral votes to the president next year. Well, it gets nastier. Remember our friend Kenneth Blackwell? A registered lobbyist for Diebold Corporation donated the largest individual sum allowable to Blackwell's current gubernatorial campaign. Could it get any worse? Yeah. In April, Mr. Blackwell announced that he was unaware that his broker had purchased shares of Diebold stock. Blackwell immediately sold those shares at a loss. Now, I'm from the great state of Texas, where dead men used to vote on a regular basis. I grew up next door to Louisiana. Need I say more? Even the founding fathers would ply voters with strong drink to sway their votes at the polls. 
But the national character of this scandal is unprecedented and threatens to turn us into little more than a banana republic where candidates appear on the ballot in name only because the election has already been determined. If we are willing to send our troops around the world to secure freedom at the ballot box for others, shouldn't we fight for that right here at home? Partisanship has no place in this battle. For the sake of democracy, for the sake of America, it is time all citizens demand the sanctity of our election process. With the November elections almost upon us, we haven't a moment to lose. And that's the This past November, when Republican Congressman Randy Duke Cunningham resigned his seat after pleading guilty to taking $2.4 million in bribes, many wondered if politics in California's 50th district could get any worse. The truth is I broke the law, concealed my conduct, and disgraced my office. Hopefully, this 100-month sentence that Mr. Cunningham received will help restore the public's confidence in our system and respect for our laws. Well, the special election held to replace Cunningham has not come close, not even 24 hours after the polls closed, and before the final count was certified with a margin of only 4,000 votes, Republicans declared Brian Bilbray the winner. Well, six days later, House Speaker Dennis Hastert posed with Bilbray in a mock swear-in ceremony. The pose was for the benefit of the press, wanting to put to rest any notion that Bilbray's victory was in question. Hours later on the House floor, Brian Bilbray was sworn in for real. You will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter, so help you God. I do, so help you God. Congratulations, you are now a member of the 109th Congress. So what's the problem? The electronic voting machines used in the election had an unauthorized sleepover before election day. And that's right. Volunteer poll workers were told to take the machines home with them. Some spent weeks in garages or in the backs of cars before going to the polling places. Why is this a problem? Simple. The Diebold optical scan and touch screen voting systems used in San Diego have been found to be easily hackable. How easily? Well, New York University's Brennan School for Justice enlisted the help of a team of cybersecurity experts who determined that one person with sophisticated technical knowledge and timely access to the software could rig an entire election. Seems far-fetched? Well, meet computer programmer Clint Curtis. On December 13, 2004, Curtis testified under oath to the House Judiciary on voting security, and here's what he had to say. Mr. Curtis, are there programs that can be used to secretly fix elections? Yes. How do you know that to be the case? Because in October of 2000, I wrote a prototype for President Congressman Tom Feeney, at the company I work for in Oviedo, Florida, that did just that. And when you say did, did just that, it would rig an election? It would flip the vote 51-49 to whoever you wanted it to go to and whichever race you wanted to win. And would that program that you designed be something that elections officials that might be on county boards of elections could detect? They'd never see it. They'd never see it. As for the special election in California's 50th district, there are lingering questions. The San Diego County Registrar says a manual recount of the paper ballot trail would cost upwards of $150,000, payable by anyone who wants to know if the election is sound and secure. It's about a buck a vote for the District 50 contest. It's an arbitrary number decided by the election board. In Orange County, a hand count is quoted at a cost of only 14 cents a vote. Well, if you think the sleepover issue is bad, there are currently voting machine-related lawsuits and investigations in 20 states across the country. Well, moving on, in the wake of Florida's 2000 presidential election uproar, President Bush set up the first-ever Election Assistance Commission. He put the Reverend DeForest Suarez in charge. Suarez, a Republican, has since quit, telling Rolling Stone magazine, quote, it wasn't until I worked in Washington on an issue as generic as this that I realized how pitiful and perhaps how hopeless Washington really is. For God's sake, if any issue should be the catalyst for bipartisan cooperation, this is the issue, voting. It was probably the worst experience of my life. I found that there's very little interest in Washington for true election reform, end quote. And therefore, very little interest in real democracy. If you want to learn more about the state of our election process, I urge you to visit bradblog.com. Brad Friedman has worked doggedly on this issue, amassing tons of valuable news and information on the subject. A recent entry of his sums up the most important question facing our democracy. Can we trust the people running our elections? 
On a recent talk show, Brad asked the Monterey County Registrar of Voters, Tony Achundo, how he would proceed in the event of election tally discrepancy. Achundo told Brad Friedman, quote, there's obviously going to have to be some trust and faith in the elections official, or in this case, it's me. Well, on July 6th, the Salinas, California newspaper reported that Tony Anchundo had just been charged with 25 counts of forgery, 14 counts of misapplication of funds, three counts of embezzlement, falsification of accounts by a public officer, and one count of grand theft. I don't want simply to trust election officials, especially since so many are activists within their political parties. I don't want simply to trust election machinery that can be easily manipulated, altered, or hacked into. Instead, I want to trust, but verify. It's time for an independent, nonpartisan election commission to monitor registration and balloting across the country, and it is time to mandate complete, verifiable security for the votes cast by citizens on Election Day. Democracy begins with the sanctity of the ballot box. It mustn't end there. You'll have to pardon me, but being an election integrity advocate, I just stop with verify. I don't even go near the trust. Um, it's really important that because this is this is our entire democracy, as you saw up there, and we're going to even have this um, uh, program without Bruce Funk. Her entire last program was based on what Bruce Funk found when he looked at the election machines. Uh, in Emory County. And the Brenham, the Brenham report was based on Harry Hursty's report, the Finnish computer scientist that was in Emory County with Bruce Funk and actually looking through those machines and digging through the circuitry and the electrons and the bits and bytes that we shouldn't even have in our election process. Um, and he produced this report that did um, say that these uh, machines were hackable. He detailed them. He sent this information and the report out privately to the Brennan Center and a lot of election officials around the U.S. Um, without giving away exactly how you did it. And when nothing really came to fruition from that, when there was no um, public outcry from election officials, black box voting, voting which helped to uh, um, pay for Harry Hursty's um, ability to be here and to look at the machines and, and uh, come up with a report, release the full unredacted report that said exactly how you could hack the machines. Uh, and um, that's when things really started to, the ball started to, to roll. If our public election officials aren't going to you know, come out and do something about it and just keep trying to keep the problems hidden. We have to go that extra mile and start releasing information to the public, and I think black box voting did just the right thing. In January, um, early January, I think on the 6th of January, I called Bruce Funk and asked him if he had opened his uh, shipment of Diebold machines because I wanted to go down there and look and see how they did their logic and accuracy testing and uh, how they, um, you know, opened up the crates and, and uh, took down serial numbers just to watch the whole process. And he had not opened the crates yet and said it wouldn't be until late January. So at that point, I had other things coming up. I was going to, I was in the middle of writing an audit bill to try and get our uh, elections audited, uh, the, the the VVPAT, the voter verified paper audit trail, and uh, that was subsequently quashed in, at the legislature anyways. So I asked him if he would um, get hold of black box voting if he saw, when he actually opened up the machines and, and looked at them, if he saw that there was any problem with them. I gave him their number and contact information, and then I called black box voting and gave them um, information about Bruce and told him he was uh, somebody who was, had very good integrity, was very concerned about elections, and specifically concerned about the Diebold machines, had been following the issue for a long time. And uh, it's not that he was ag against machines totally. Obviously, he had op scanners and had been using them for, since 1996. Um, but he was aware of the problems that uh, had been that he had heard about Diebold. And so I'll let you, I'll let him tell you about, uh, pick up from there and how he, or if he wants to 
what he can tell you at this point because it is in some some particular things about his former employment are in litigation. So. I don't believe that I'm any different than any one of you. I don't think that uh, if you were in my position, you would have done anything different than I did. I think that uh, what I did was, uh, was what I had to do. Uh, many people have asked me, do you have any regrets? I said, no. I would do the same thing again, knowing what I know. Uh, the reason, as Joyce Lynn mentioned, that I held off doing the acceptance and testing until the latter part of January uh, was that I insisted that uh, Diebold, I don't know whether it's Diebold or Diebold, that I, I've been thinking about that the last few days and it just really has a, a nice feel to it. But I asked that uh, their top computer technician uh, be in attendance at that uh, testing and acceptance. Uh, this was a result of uh, after the counties and the machines had been forced on me uh, and I had reluctantly accepted them and had decided that I was going to put my best effort forward and in fact uh, we took possession of the machines on December 27th of 2005. Uh, prior to that uh, in November annually the county association has their meeting which all the elected officials meet and Dana Latour, who is the sales rep for, I don't know how much of the United States, I know at least the western states, uh, stood up before us as county clerks and said, on election day, some of you are going to hate my guts. And I'm thinking, looking around and I'm thinking, why would she say something like that? And I'm looking at the other county clerks and, uh, you know, they don't seem to be really disturbed. So I just uh, took it and locked it back in the back of my mind. But that's why I insisted uh, that I wait till the Diebold computer technician come. And at that time, on the, uh, when they did the acceptance and testing, that person was named Andrew Call, K-A-H-L. And I said, Andrew, I said, what did she mean by that statement? And he says, oh... On election day, we're going to have some problems and we're just going to have to work through them. Well, I'm not that type of a person because as an election official, and I was looking strictly at Emory County, I wanted the elections to be of the utmost integrity. And as an election official, you try to anticipate anything that may or might go wrong. And you want to plan for that, realizing that there are those times and things that do happen unexpectedly like in the previous uh, general election, when the power went out in the middle of the day, and I've got judges of election who are trying to find out voter registration, and I can't bring up the system. And I call, and, and, and it's down more or less statewide in spots. And so I call the Utah emergency, and I said, what can you do? And she said, well, you need to talk to your emergency manager down there, and gave me the name, and I said, well, as far as I know, he's a wet spot in the road, and that person laughed, and I thought, you know him too, don't you? And so it was very interesting. I said, let me see what I can do. The power plant's only three miles south of me here, so I know a few people out there, and I call and get into the plant, and I said, can you switch me to this place and that place and to the control center? So I end up with the people right on the controls, and I tell them what the situation is, and he says, well, let's see what we can do for you. He says, you got any now? No. What about now? Still nothing. Let me try this. Comes back a minute. He says, you should have something now. I says, yeah, I do. So I call the lady back, and I says, we got it taken care of down here. And she said, you know, it's interesting. We've had a number of outages across the state today. Unusual. So it's not always who you know, but uh, where you can go and, and how things do transpire. I don't know where to begin because there is so much information 
So much of my life has been consumed since probably 2004. I really got into it in, in January of 2005 uh, when things started to build. And as Joyce indicated, I was aware of things going on and, and it was hard to keep people straight as far as I knew them. I had followed uh, many things in regards to the selection process and the group that was uh, to select the computers of uh, uh, the election equipment for the state of Utah. I elected to stay off that because I had the touchscreen uh, voting equipment. I was very satisfied, not the touchscreen, but the optically scanned. Joyce, you need to stay right here and correct me when I s say things straight in case I miss them that has worked very effectively for me. And I didn't want to unduly influence that group. And I told Olene Walker at the time, who was the lieutenant governor and had created the state plan, and her agreement with me was that, you know, you have equipment that meets uh, most of the requirements under HAVA. You just need the handicap requirement to be met. So if we can look at you and just provide you with the handicapped equipment. I said, no. I want to see what's out there and have the option of either staying with what I have and then implementing uh, the additional hobby equipment, or I do want to go if there is something new that is satisfactory and meets the needs of the voters of Emory County. And so that was the understanding we had, was that I had the option. But as I indicated in November of 2005, things were all tied up. I had fought desperately against him, knowing what was there. A lot of it became apparent when uh, Salt Lake Tribune, the editor, Paul Raleigh, done an article with lobbyists like these who need enemies. And lo and behold, uh, it affected a small town of East Carbon there, which I was familiar with on the landfill there. And I went to the state side, and I called up the Utah lobbyists, and I put in Diabold and... Sure enough, here five names came up, and these are the same lobbyists that he was talking about, five of the top lobbyists in the state of Utah. Later, in uh, 2005, in, in 8 of 2005, uh, Salt Lake County Commission challenged the Tetris Group. Come to find out, they were also lobbyists for the Salt Lake County, and so they questioned the conflict there. And in, as a result, much of the landfill that the Salt Lake County was entrusted to and oversaw was lobbied away from them also. And so there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, I attended a meeting that was set up for January 19th in 2006. And you're going to find me jumping all over because some of these things relate to a little more of this and a little more of that. And so, you know, I'm, you're going to find me going here and there. It was a meeting set up for county clerks. It was held there in the uh, Utah County Courthouse uh, in the administration building. It was set for January 26th, uh, and uh, in going to that, they kind of outlined that uh, the Clerks Association plan there, Luann Adams and Pat Beckstead will present ideas and tips from their experience with the new equipment and the municipal elections held in their county. We'll dis discuss supplies and so on and so forth. Do you remember those two municipal elections? They went very well, didn't they? You know, first thing they said is we need to talk to some, about some things before Diebold comes in. And, you know, we don't want anyone else to know this. And I'm thinking, what are we hiding now? And so... What they start with is, some of them are the wrong version. They had bad batteries, unplugged, the latches didn't work, the wiring behind there, the audio speakers didn't work, the housing needed oil, the lamps, and it on and on and on. And what struck me next was that seven out of the 35 machines, there were seven paper jams. Now, that was significant to me. The barcodes they talked about and everything else. And I'm thinking, as county elected officials now, we are hiding 
what they are. The other one took quite pride when one of the news media said, uh, what security measures do you have in regards to the machines? Well, overhead there, there were some uh, video cameras, security camera type things, and chuckled to us, but they weren't hooked up. So, Scott Hodginson of Weber County uh, kind of became the kind of computer guru uh, for the county clerks, uh, felt that uh, needed to maintain a paper trail, was very obvious, uh, wrote to the lieutenant governor and comply with recent legislation and so on and so forth. He's been in contact and, you know, that needs to be there in order to restore the public confidence. I also have on a CD all of my emails. Let me just give you an example of one of them because us county clerks were starting to communicate uh, what happens here. Uh, this is from Peter Lenhart. Uh, he is uh, probably over the state of Utah with a carbon copy to Doug Applebaum, uh, who is another one under him. Uh, Scott sent to him, he says, what should the counties do with all the bad cords, failed printer housings, bad keys, pads, and such? I'd like these item items back to Diabold quickly. My staff keep making reference to having a Viking funeral for all pile of defective items. Uh, Peter's reply is, uh, I will have your regional tech, Matt, Tennyson call you, uh, printer failure hanging, so on and so forth, and so on. And so, next comes the problems uh, to me uh, sent, that problems with the cords being upside down, you couldn't open the computer or the terminals and turn them on because the cords were made wrong. You had to have the smiley face up. If you turned them up, you couldn't open the door. Uh, <clears throat> wrong labels on the machines. Uh, Joycelyn, even found and, and got the state to admit that serial numbers on the machines did not match those that were in memory. And, and they provided, she made them fess up to that in black and white writing. Housings and the casings were crooked, memory card doors wouldn't lock. This is where you turn them on. This is where the access is to the machine that Harry Hershey worked with. Lots of late problems. Modem doors defective. You could pull them out. They came right out. Audio problems. Machines had wrong software. Blah, 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 blah. So on and so forth. Then it got to, and I was aware of back in California in August of 2005, the Diabold failures in which uh, California uh, basically rejected them. And in there, they talked of about a 10% failure rate. And what really turned out was more like a 20% failure rate. Most of you remember the mock election that was held in the, the South Town Mall. We were at, uh, the decision had not been made yet. We were down to two vendors. Diabold was one. ESNS was the election substance and software which was the vendor of my optical scan equipment, and so I was very familiar with uh, Tim Knust, who is the vice president over probably the southern states in the United States, but he has one arm that reaches out to Utah and covers Utah as part of his territory, and has been to and worked with the county clerks for years, acquainting them with the optically scanned, the touch screen machines, and so on and so forth. And so at the South Town, I found out that a Diabold had hauled the machine out. And so I, I made note of that and commented to the county clerks that Diabold had hauled one of the machines out. Well, the lieutenant governor's office said both of them hauled one out. And uh, so I asked Tim, I says, is that true? And he says, well, I'm not aware of it. He says, but let me check it out. And he called me back. He says, I have to apologize. We took one out too. And I says, uh, what was the reason? He says, the screen calibration was off. So rather than, you know, touch it and pre-program it in, it was easier to pull it out and, and stick another one in its place. Uh, I observed and I played around with Diabold's uh, 
uh, optically scan machine. And I noticed the front door was open on that, so I asked the attendant there, I said, how come the door is open? Well, it seems like that if there's an undervote or an overvote, and the person doesn't want to change that, that's the only way we can get it to, to accept it. And I thought that's very unusual that that type of access was available uh, to a voter on there too. So <clears throat> I asked him, I says, well, how many machines did each of you had, have at that point? He said, we each had three. So if you stop and figure out the mathematics again, it's a 20% failure rate. In Deseret News, in August 7th, there again, there is no sense trusting the most important public act of a democracy to an unproven technology. But now the state ought to wait just a little bit longer. The vendor it chooses, it chose, Diebold is having serious problems. And so they go on and so on and forth. Screen turn, <clears throat> turning blue are illegal. Fatal sign or encryption errors were what the, fate st the state found when they tested them. And so these machines went through a state testing. McPherson decided he was going to toughen up in California and give them another chance. You guys proved to us that the machines are worthy. Rather than taxpayers spending monies, you proved to us. And so Diabold turned over to them the software. And California did give them kind of a recertification. And so I had kind of questions as to why just the software. And so we went through the acceptance and testing. We're back in January now, if you haven't figured out, in 2006. I'm going to tell you, here is the, the list you go through doing the Diabold acceptance and testing. The first ones is you open up the door, turn on the switch, this, that, and that, and you set the correct time and day and the printer configuration that accepts it. And then you test the modem. And a lot of them this is where a lot of them failed. The modem was a very important part of that initial testing. And so I'm going through and accepting and testing, and I told you what Andrew told me, and I'm being really, really fine about this whole thing. I'm a positive person now. You know, I know all these problems and these concerns. I had educated myself for well over a year now, and I knew about black box voting. And I had became somewhat familiar with Joyce Lynn. And uh, I knew that there were those people out there who said there were conspiracies and all this and that. And, and I had to separate those away. I had to find people and became familiar with those who were legitimate that I could trust and, and so forth. I did this unconsciously in my mind. And so... What had happened was, after we'd done the acceptance and testing in the end of January, I had taken a machine down into my office so that we could become familiar with it because I was overwhelmed with the, the process in order to prepare for an election and what questions we're going to have and if this doesn't work, what that. Part of this anticipation. And at the same time, uh, I had had one up in the where they were being stored that I noticed that the paper was starting to track off a little bit to one side, which I knew probably wasn't proper. But out of the initial acceptance and testing, six of them failed out of 40 machines which we were allotted. I allowed two of them to be repaired and retested and, and accepted, so they took back four. And so with uh, this in our office, Hey, these dear bold people broke their backs to please me. They brought me candies. You know, they came in my office with fear in their eyes. And I'm not really that scary. And when they left, they thought, yeah, he's, he's all right. And so I don't know whether it was Peter or which one of them came in. I said, I need to talk to you about a problem with the one I have upstairs. And I explained it to him. He says, well, you need to reject that one. He says, let me take this one you've got here in your office and show you what you need to look for. And so he opens it up and he says, you need to reject this one too. So there's two more machines I've got to reject. 
So he's saying, here's what you need to look for. And so he showed me, now I need to go back through all the machines and check them now for this thing, which is the, the thing needs to be clear against the side and so on and so forth. And so I have now, a little later here, received two machines back. And so I start upstairs. They've been unplugged for a couple of weeks, so I think, well, maybe I'll see what the batteries are doing. Some of the counties have found that they failed really soon. And so I'm taking me up a little pasty and sticking it on them, checking the battery and, and checking the, the carriage. And I don't know what happened because I was not consciously looking for it. But my mind was yanked back to that machine and said, this one is different. I didn't know what was different. And, and so I'm looking down here in the bottom where it says, you know, the charge on the battery and backup storage memory and so on and so forth. And so I said, better look at the next machine. So I pull the next machine out, and lo and behold, it is. There's this different, and it's in the backup storage memory. This one has very little, and this one is up in the 28, 29 megabytes. And as I went through those machines, I now found that I had eight out of 38 machines which had as little as four megabytes of backup storage memory. The one, and they, some of these were highlighted in red, and that machine is saying to me, I've got a problem, you know? And that's when I said, what do I do? You know, Diebold in the state of Utah would say, I should have asked Diebold what the problem is. I've asked Diebold about things, and what answers did I get? The lieutenant governor's office, the election office, what experience have they had with these? Zero. Experience on election, zero. You know, I have dealt with them and their answer, and they have picked me out as a troublemaker when I've asked questions, and I've tried to alert county clerks that there are these lobbyists and laws are being drafted that benefit one vendor. And so I, that time, knew who to call. And after making that call, and I don't know what prompted me to, but I talked to them, said, I've got a problem. And I was familiar with what had happened down in Leon County, Florida, with Ion Sancho, in that black box voting had brought Harry Hershey and Hugh Thompson in there and had done similar investigations into the optically scanned machines of Diabold. Diabold again, getting good there. And that they had actually reversed election results. And I said, what is the possibility of you looking at these machines as an independent source? And they said, yes, that would be a possibility. Before you do, we would like you to talk to Ion. And they gave me his number and I talked to him. And I said, what did you go through? And he kind of went through the process. And, and uh, <clears throat> what had happened then was that he was now in a position where he needed to meet the hobby requirement. He had the optically scan system by Diabold, but Diabold was not going to sell him the touchscreen to take care of the handicap because of what he had done with there. And so they weren't going to sell to him. ESNS wasn't going to sell to him. No one was going to send him. For the handicapped, he said, Jed, Jeb, and the person over elections, he says, they're pushing to get me out. And then some miraculous thing came about and reversed the people, and they came out and supported him and what he was trying to do. And as a result, the state then turned around and brought an antitrust suit against the vendors later. And to make a long story short, Diabold did then sell those to him. But I did become familiar with him. He thinks no different than you and I. Elections have to be of the utmost integrity. They are the very basic fabric of our Constitution. You need to have the openness. You need to assure the public. He has his machines 
where there is a camera that watches them 24 hours a day. You can log on to his website, the county, and you can observe that any hour of the day, those machines sitting there. But he says, I haven't got anyone who complains about that. And, and I can guarantee him that no one is in there touching him. So I felt good about it. I called Diabold, well, Diabold, not Diabold, but uh, Black Box Voting called me back. I happen to have our IT person who is a former uh, Novell technician. When Novell was laying people off, he's a former Emory Countyite who wanted to come home. And I have been fighting a fight to get him back home. I went through the same process. And when Novell was laying him off, and I was trying to recruit him and the people in data processing and over it were fighting me against it, they were offering him thousands of shares and thousands of dollars if he would stay. But I won. But he was sitting in my office when we got that call, and we talked to Jim Marsh, and he answered the questions we had as we felt they needed, that we needed to know and the assurances that we needed that nothing was going to be manipulated and that they simply come in as an independent source. And so I arranged for that on the two conditions. Number one, that you protect my IT person. Secondly, that you protect my staff because I was not planning to run for re-election again. And I did not want anything to shadow the individual in my office uh, who was going to file and run in my place. And that was the agreement we went. And so the exact date, I can't remember, but uh, Harry Hershey, uh, when they could arrange with him and his schedule to come from Finland, and uh, we met there in the, the storage room, and I provided access of a machine to Harry Hershey. And I wish you could see this individual. Uh, he's just a tremendous man. And I, he's not an old person like me. He's a young person, I don't know age. Uh, and uh, it was like handing him a new toy that he had so much wanted to have. And he was so excited. And all I did was provide it to him. Black box voting, all they do the three of them, Bev Harris, Kathleen Wynn, Jim Marsh, is that they videotape everything that he does so that everything is documented and they can't be accused of doing anything, you know, as far as the machines and tearing them apart and, and putting stuff on those. And so those documents and that video is kept on file. And so he went through there. One of the first things he discovered and I was there, and I'm not a computer expert, but he says to me, this is very interesting. I mean, he said this a number of times, and, and uh, you know, he talks to this computer, and I call it a computer, but you've got to bear with me. I'm talking about the voting machine, okay? But to him, it's a person almost, and he talks to it, and he, you don't like this, you know? It's a one-on-one -on -one type thing. Okay, let's see, what, what about this, you know? And, and it's, it's like a relationship, and it's my baby. Baby doesn't like this, so on and so forth. And so he calls my attention to something, and, and Bev and, and those there, he says, this is very interesting. This machine, I can program right from the machine, and I can put on a, is it a macro program? A program that this machine because it's not hooked to a modem, can't do it, but it thinks it's going out and getting something and bringing it back and performing an operation, and it isn't logged on. Nothing is logged. You know, I says, well, what does this mean? He says, this means that this machine by modem, somebody can connect into it if by modem. Well, I'm saying right now, we're never going to hook this thing to a modem in Emory County. You know, I'm thinking Emory County. And uh, I says, well, what else? He says, there could be a program in there anywhere already latent that may even be 
time, date, sensitive, that activates, and nothing is logged. You can go in and change the time on that machine, the date. You could go in and enter the votes on election day. We could have that night, day. Set the date on election day and the time during. Log, then change the date back. Log out. Nothing shows up anywhere. Amazing. So I go down and get my IT person, and I says, what do you think about this? What's he saying? You know, they're, they're, they talk serious computer stuff. You know, and they're nodding heads, this and that, and I'm, I know what he's saying. And as we go through the process and on a number of these occasions, uh, <clears throat> my IT person says, well, that means you could even change out um, what's the basic software on, that you start with? The bootloader. And you can also change out the operating system. This thing will let you do that. And it's not even logged. And these two are going, yeah. And, and there's one, I guess, that's out there in the public domain. And Jeff says, well, you, you could do this even on it then, couldn't you? And Harry never responded. But he came back the next day and he said, he was right about that. You know, so you, I'm in the presence of brilliant minds here. And I know nothing, but I, I'm watching what, what I'm observing is starting to concern me. And I, we still haven't got down to the memory problem that started this thing in the beginning. And what I'm finding is that Harry is finding something that's really Harry. And, and he's not wanting to talk about it. And I'm saying, what? And he said, this is so serious that I need to have Hugh Thompson, who was down in the Florida, go over this with me. And so that was the next request he made of black box voting, is when can we set up a visit with uh, Hugh? Well, he and Harry are on these schedules, and, you know, they're both geniuses. Harry is almost, uh, I don't know how many languages he reads, but he has total, almost total recall of anything he sees. So I can't even think of the word there. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying too, don't you? Yeah, see? Okay. He was over the networks and the communications for I don't know how many European countries. They were later bought out by, I don't know whether it was Quest or some big outfit. He later managed those. Uh, he later said, hey, I'm too young. This is eating up my time. And they bought him out. And so he spends all his time doing whatever he wants. Basically, he does security. I set him down one afternoon, and I said, Hugh, or Harry, I, I want to know something about you. You know, uh, what is it that you do have? We're bringing in, you know, for Windows expertise, Hugh Thompson, where is your expertise? He says, well, I do not have a, quote, title. I says, well, what have you done in your life? Give me an example. He says, well, let me tell you one. He says, myself and four of my buddies were hired by a bank. He said, we, were, we went in, we set up so many accounts. I don't remember what the number was exactly. He says, then we went, all of us, out on the same day at the same time and deposited $100 in each of those accounts. He says, and then we went back to our computers. And he says, well, you have to realize that after the first three tries, the bank system kicks you out. He says, so the first day, he said, we were locked out. He said, so we sat around and we thought a while, what would be the most logical access words? He says, you know what we did? We went back the next day. And we got into 20,000 accounts the next day. 
He says, we went to the bank and told them what they needed to do to prevent this type of thing. The bank says, don't know about some of those. We can do some of these. He says to me, he says, you know what scares me? He says, those doors are still open today. Now keep in mind, because I'm going to tell you something about him when he talks about the guy who wrote the Diabold program. And so that gives you a little familiarity with him. So then we meet in Salt Lake. I try to get them to meet over here on this side because there's some suites that have kind of like office and they've given us a special government rate. But Hugh Thompson is on a tight schedule and so they schedule out something out here on North Templar where it goes out the airport and just before it forks and there's a hotel right there, Bay something or I don't know what it is. I says, okay. So I arrive there and, and black box floating people are there. They're waiting for Hugh Thompson to arrive. And, and uh, so we get situated. Uh, Hugh arrives. I meet him and introduce to him and and uh, black box floating people go and I, I hand him my uh, voting machine. <laughs> and here again, another young man who gets so just, oh, thank you. And I don't tell him one stinking thing. And he starts with card and starts tapping. Wow, this is interesting. He says, oh, I've got something for you. Now if I can find it. He gives me this. It says, How to Break Software Security. <laughs> Hugh H. Thompson. And in the back, the CD to do it. <laughs> this is a man who is in so much demand, goes to Berkeley, every university across the United States, lecturing, so on and so forth. And so I walk over to lunch with myself. Are you with me? No? <laughs> so you can tell you my age, the short-term memory is starting to take effect. But uh, I sat down to each, eat in the lunchroom or the cafe there. And that's a very remote location as far as I'm concerned. Emory County is far. But as far as running into somebody, I have been trying to lurk locate a very special individual to me in my life for well over three years. I knew he was from Salt Lake and the last time I talked to him I was concerned and, and I said, Perry, you know, this company's not going to survive without you. You're trying to keep it going for your kids. You know, you need to have a life. And next thing I knew, the company was gone, the location was gone, every phone number I think all I had was a first name. And I sat down there, and as they were serving my salad, this older fellow came to the cash register on his way out and with his sack, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, I have been wanting to find you. We've been going to come down and see you. I said, Perry, you don't know what this means to me. And I had the funniest and the strangest feeling this is right, what you're doing? Ever had a confirmation? I had it. So take it for what it's worth. And so I kidded Hugh and Harry the next day, and, and they're both singles. They've neither one been able to get married because they get so involved, and the computers just engulf them. And I said, I'm county clerk. I can marry you. You know, you know we've had relationships, but we can't sustain them because this is so much of their life. And at that time, I thought to myself, thank God that there are people like this that do this for us. Because without them, I would not be here. You would not be here with me in this situation. Joyce Lynn would not be doing a lot of what she's doing. The whole United States would not be doing what they're doing. And to make a long story short, let me briefly tell you what, and Joycelyn probably knows a lot more about it than I do, that 
uh, as was, we sat down with Harry that night, and uh, I'm not the type to go sit in. There's kind of a lounge next door. Harry, who is from Finland, has a a uh, thing about every place he goes. He's got to try diff- their beer. So you were with me. <laughs> she was very reluctant to go. But we sat down with him. And uh, I asked Harry, because now we're starting to know what the problem is, that it is so severe that it is intentional holes in the software at at least three levels down. And Harry says to me, he says, I've met this man who wrote this program. He's very smart, very intelligent. I know he and I are alike. We think the same. He said they will never catch him. The only time they will catch him is when he gets overconfident. And I'm thinking, and there's those holes in those banks, you know. And Harry's not patting himself on the back. But he says, I know this man. I know that these things are intentional. And he went and came back after this date with the password that accessed him into those locations. Now, this stuff is not new that I'm telling you. It's been published in black box voting. If I've said something wrong, you need to correct me when I I do. Uh, Initially, after this meeting, we involved uh, Paul Raleigh of the Salt Lake Tribune. And, oh, did we overload him. I mean, to give him the stuff. We didn't tell him about the major security problems because... That was a no-no. That had to go to the federal people first and let them be aware of and provide the protection for the voters and the integrity of the elections. And so we stayed away from that. But the outlets, the other security problems, anything else, uh, how easy they are, uh, basically Paul Rowley put in an article in the Salt Lake Tribune and said voters are in for a real shock meaning that the the plugs could be undone. I called Sherry Swenson, and I love Sherry. She's a county clerk from a large municipality who will talk to a peon county clerk. And she asked me the things in the article. She says, well, I've talked to my IT person. They says, oh, yeah, if you can get a hold and wrangle those, yeah, those cords are going to come out. I said, Sherry, they don't. I can walk down through those machines and pop every one of them as I walk by them. I said... The low memory, she says, well, that's because there are different fonts on there. And I says, I don't know yet. And she said to me, she says, well, thinking about it, there can't be different fonts on there, can there? You know, to me, fonts were, you know, from what I'm finding on what little in computer is the size of the letter, the shape of the characters and things. And and I think she was thinking the same, too. And so she discussed a number of these things, but basically the people... And the state people said it, and Diabold said, oh, these are nothings, and so on and so forth. And so on goes my life. And what I have here, and I'm not going to go through with you, is that the things that have transpired. Let me get right down to what happened to me then. It came down to uh, Diabold finding then that I had provided black box voting access uh, to the election equipment. And therefore, they put pressure on the state and set up a special meeting with the commission on March 27th of 2006. Before it goes on, do you hear this? A private corporation is in our elections pressuring our election officials, our top one for the state, to do something about a public servant we have elected. Who is Diebold? They are the manufacturers of the voting machines that we are now using in our elections. Yes. We just got through using in the primary that we will be using. This is an American company? Um, it, it is. Yes. They, they, they manufacture machines in North Carolina and Ohio. They're based in Ohio. 
At what level at the state, when you say the state, they, they put pressure on the state? Was it the governor's office, lieutenant governor's office? Yes. Lieutenant governor and uh, Michael Craig on the election. Uh, and I'll fill, give you those names here as I kind of fill you in on this part now because it becomes very crucial. Uh, black box voting uh, sent to the state, uh, Gary Herbert, and all the people involved exactly what had transpired in an effort to you know, give me some protection. You know, what he done was the right thing and so on and so forth. I had earlier in March 23 indicated to the commission that in order to resolve the issue on the voting equipment in the upcoming election for two years, the conditions I see necessary to assure accurate voting are the following which must be satisfactorily addressed to me. Diebold must certify to Emory County Honor before April 10 of 2006 the following. All terminals are unused, that there are no prior elections on them. There are no non-native residing software in the machine. All motherboards are new and the same. The same software is on the machines. And Diebold must put in writing the reason for the low backup storage memory. I still don't have the answer. So they are now putting together this meeting. And so they call this together uh, from the Lieutenant Governor's office as Joe Dema. Is that how I say it? Dema? 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 Shoot. He's the spokesperson for uh, Lieutenant Governor's office. Fred from the Attorney General's office. Oh, Tom Roberts. See how good I am? I know who I need her. Tom Roberts, legal counsel for the lieutenant governor's office, and then also Michael Cragen came down. Joining them in the same flight, and I found that out thanks to Joyce Lynn, I said, did these people all go back together? I'm trying to figure out how word got out so fast afterwards. Then from Diebold was this Dana Latour, Andrew Call, and Diebold legal counsel. Now, Emory County Commission is there, the three commissioners, Commission Chairman Ira Hatch, uh, Gary Coford, and Drew Citrid. They had their legal counsel, David Blackwell. I don't know if he's related, this Blackwell. I'm wondering now. And also in attendance was the Emory County Sheriff. And taking minutes was the secretary out of the county attorney's office, which the gals in my office, out of respect, didn't want to take the minutes, and I understand that, and I respected that, and, and it was a good thing. And so, at the beginning of the meeting, because I know a little bit about Utah law, now you got to remember one thing, Mr. Blackwell doesn't like me. And it stems from a couple of reasons. One of them is that as the county clerk, uh, some nine years ago, I received also the duties of the county auditor. I used to say I was liked when I was a county clerk. As county auditor, I held the same expectations of them as I do of me, honesty and integrity. And that's hard to do when you're the auditor. And you have to let something slide because, man, you'd be up over your head every minute. But Mr. Blackwell was uh, very upset with me one in budget meetings when he wanted to give his employees a raise and I said uh, well Mr. Blackwell do your employees do your private practice work? No. I'm not dumb. I didn't push it. Mr. Blackwell comes back to me the next day and he says well my secretary tells me she finds some city uh, business on on the computer. Well okay. And the next thing I'm knowing, he's having to cancel out of all his contracts with the, the towns in the county. And they were all being done by county employees on county stuff. And so he doesn't like me. I cost him financially. And there's some other things in relation to an employment issue and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so I'm not very, you know, a friend of his. You know, I don't hold any harsh feelings towards anyone in my life. You know, I, life is too short. If they want to, that's fine. And so 
beginning of the meeting. Now you have to remember, the written minutes are the official things of the commission. But I immediately done a records request, much like she does, and I asked for the recordings of the open portions of the meetings and the closed portions of the meetings. Now I'm in the first open portion of the meeting. We're all present there. There are some public there. There are the news media there, local paper. She's owned by the sheriff and attorney, too. So, you know, and the first thing I say to them, uh, and the wording on this, and I don't think I can find it real fast, but it talks about uh, they have never done this wording before. The Anyway, it's the, the mental capacity, and uh, they're holding a closed portion of their meeting, and it goes on and on. And I said, you know, you're going to talk about me. I want this to be an open meeting. I want to be able to defend myself. I said, commissioners, you have legal counsel. All of you have your legal counsel. Where is my legal counsel? And state law says that I am entitled to legal counsel from the county. Now, I knew that, and I'm sure they knew that. They told me I didn't need legal counsel. And so they pursued to have all of us leave and go into that meeting. Uh, began with the commissioners. The first ones called in was the people from the state of Utah who I mentioned and their legal counsel and so on and so forth. And while they were in attendance in there, they also called in the Diabold people. And then after quite some time, and all this time my wife and I are on the outside and, and some members of my family, uh, not knowing what's going on. And then the meeting is opened up again to the public. So we have a first open meeting and a first closed meeting. Now we're into the second open meeting. And they're indicating to me, to us present, that are invited in, uh, these people need to get back to Salt Lake uh, if you have any questions and uh, things that you want to ask them. Uh, you can do that, and then we'll excuse them and, and then have another closed meeting with me. And so, you know, I'm caught at the spur of the moment. What do I do? Luckily, those questions and things that were in that I just read to you came to my mind just like that. And come to find out, they said all of these are new machines. Are there any macros or foreign programs, non-native programs on there? No. I said, Andrew, do you remember our conversation back in the acceptance and testing when I said, I really want to test these machines. They either fail in the very first short time or they fall, fell way down the road, don't they? And what did you tell me? You told me that we could put on a macro that we could do that, that would pound those machines until it ran out of paper. He says, well, that program is already on there. I said, oh, really? Yeah, that's part of the software that comes with the machine. I'm thinking, well, what else is on there? So, so there's no response here. You know, their attorney's saying, you know, we'll accept this written record as official rather than us certifying it in the thing, you know. And they're kind of consulting back and forth. And so <clears throat> we're talking about the new machines. And I finally squeeze out of him, what about the memory? Well, that's because they have different fonts. <laughs> what has the different fonts got to do and why do these machines have more than others? Well, these came out of our California warehouse, but they're new. I said, so what do, they, what do they have on them? Do they have other elections? No. I says, I think they do. I think there are other major elections on there because you can clean them off. And as far as the terminal says, it doesn't show a record of anything. And what he told me is that they have other languages on them which use up that memory like Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, anything that you might encounter. 
why this is important is because we have a contract for 7,000, approximately 7,000 new machines to be purchased from Diebel. If in fact what he's saying is true, we were getting used machines at a new machine price. That's illegal. Uh, can, can we prove it? Go ahead. Are these machines manufactured here in the United States or do they come from a foreign nation? They are assembled here in the United States. And that was made such a big issue back in a, uh, April 20th, 2005, in which Joyce and I attended a legislative sub interim committee. What is it called? That made recommendation on legislation and things in regards to that. And one of the things they sit there and pounded ES and S over the head with was that components and your machines are made outside the United States. And Tim said, at times when we can't meet demands, yes, we do have to go out. Very honest. I won't tell you what I did. I later looked in one of their machines under the view of the camera where you could take off the backs because the screws are not secure either. And every one of their parts are out of every other country. You know, but these legislators were pounded in the head. Your things are not U.S. made. And Diebold is ATM, and we need to do this, and go on and so forth. But getting back to those memory machines, Andrew also admitted that there were three different versions now. A version A, B, and C. Difference in motherboards depending on when they were manufactured. Another curious thing was that we found little yellow quarter inch dots on the handles of most of these machines that had memory problems. That's the reason. You know, were they the ones rejected out of California? I don't know. Joycelyn has told you what it takes to get records out of the government. Can you imagine what it is to get records out of a private company? You can't. So can we prove it? No. But it's very unusual, isn't it? I've got three versions now. Lots of languages on. And now I'm in an open meeting. And what else can I ask? I run out. So the commission says, thank you for coming. You know, prior to me going in, them opening up to an open meeting there, one of the, the people standing outside the window said, you know, must be through their shaking hands <laughs> in there. Then they invite me in, and then they were now sent them on their way. And so what they stated to me and I can't tell you all that went on in my portion of the closed meeting because that's what the appeal that I'm appealing to the records committee is about, is to open those up and make those public. And so that's what we're pursuing. But I can tell you how I feel, and I can tell you the results of after. And so let me kind of deal and summarize it in kind of the after effect, I was accused of causing some forty to fifty thousand dollars damage to the machines in Emory County when I had told them they have only touched two machines. I gave them in a letter prior to this, I am willing to pay the cost to replace those two machines. No. The commission says we are going to stay with Diebold. I wanted to stay with the optically scanned and, and use the Diebold if I had to for the handicap. That was not an option. You're going to do this. And they at one time brought such immense pressure on me. And as I had followed this and I first investigated it and I was first broke, I had thousands of personal emails to me. 
And there came a point when all of that was faces to me. And I had read those personal emails. And that came so heavily upon me. I felt so alone. I couldn't, I can't describe you how clear to the bottom of my soul I was. Pardon? No. These emails were in support. And I'm thinking, I'm here having to hold up this whole entire, what to me was almost the nation. I mean, I had them from every state and out of the country. And I was brought down to the bottom of my soul, and my wife was there. And I finally said, and she said, let me tell you something, commissioners. My husband's life has been one of honesty and integrity. Need I say more? She knows that, and I know that. And I was emotionally drained and everything, Dean. And it came to a point I said, I am so tired. I just want out. And it took me only that long to put my foot in my mouth. I can't explain that, you know. And I know there's no comparison, but I, I kind of think it must be like, you know, somebody who's captured or tortured or something. It was that kind of a feeling, although it was not that severity. And I... You know, no way compared to them. And so, at that time, I said, you know, just let me out of here. And so, they said, well, we're all emotional right now. Well, you know, you turn us in a formal letter in the morning, and we will formally accept it. And basically, they done a motion to accept my resignation. I thought I had the night to think about it. That meeting adjourned. I went down to my office on the next floor. They went to theirs. And Glenn Warchell of the Salt Lake Tribune called me on the phone. I was just sitting there thinking, what in the heck did you just do? You know, I almost felt like it was meant for me to say that. I don't know why. What caused that? And I said, well, Glenn, I have the night to think about it, and I will know in the morning, and I'll let you know. That next morning came. Very first thing, Commissioner Chairman Iyer Hatch came by my office, and I said, Commissioner Hatch, I'm not going to resign. I said, I think I need to be here and oversee what Diabol does to those machines and assure the integrity of those machines to the people of Emory County. And his words to me was, that's not going to happen. Next thing I know, I get a hand-delivered letter from the county attorney outlining my resignation. And so I hand-deliver to the commission office. Let me read you that. This is dated March 29th. And this was the same day. I received your letter of March 28, 2006, because I got it at five, almost 5 o'clock. Uh, I had resigned my elected position as Emory County Clerk Auditor. I want the record to be perfectly clear. I have not resigned, and I intend to complete my term of office as Emory County Clerk Auditor, a position which I was duly elected to by the people of Emory County. You know, and that's why I'm where I'm at, and, <laughs> and I'm committed, and I know what's in these machines, and I can't, I am only the messenger, and talk about people wanting to kill me in this state. Let me read you from one state. And then I want to take answers. Okay, let's see. Because I think this is important. These were the people I was seeing at that time. Lisa Ann G. Altman, Nassau, 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 help me, Nassau County Legislator. I am writing a letter to offer my support to your effort to expose the problems with Diabol TSX touchscreen voting machines. 
I am a strong advocate of the optically scanned system and hope your experience will serve as an example of why they are the best machines available. Nassau County, which is New York, and she is the legislator in District 10, has yet to choose a machine, and I will continue to advocate for optically scanned. I hope you are successful in your attempts to raise awareness of the voting irregularities that could arise using the touch machines. I applaud your dedications, and if anything I can do, let me help you. I have a person from the Homeland Security. I have him from Canada. You guys down in the States are sure screwed up. <laughs> you know, I have him from countries where people are watching our legislation. So let me, in the interest of time, and while Joycelyn is here, let me answer questions. I've probably created some. Let me go ahead. Um, back in probably the first part of 2005, I don't know, there, this issue kind of came to light. And uh, I wrote to uh, Senator Howard Stevenson and uh, Representative David Cox, who were in my district of Utah. And uh, anyway, I, I basically remember corresponding mostly with Howard Stevenson, but several emails back and forth, and I, I, I'm a computer person, and I told him what I needed to feel good about the machine. And he invited me in to talk to him, and uh, anyway, I never did that, but basically in an email, he wrote me back and said, uh, well, this... A lot of things have to be worked out. We're nowhere near uh, settling on this, and I, you know, basically I don't see this the state ever purchasing this. The very next thing I know, we've got these machines, and I'm just a little shocked as to how did we get these to start with? The, I mean, was this the the Senate, the legislature, the governor? Who kind of approved this and kind of circumvented the? I, I don't know, I didn't, I'm just kind of wondering if you know how this really, how it was forced on us. And it's not just in our state. It's happening all over. I can only tell you from those things that I've experienced, and, and Joycelyn has been there in there on a lot of them. In that November meeting in the general session, Michael Cragen spoke, this is in 2005, on touchscreen voting, and he raved on and on. What well, had to be before that? Yeah, in 2004, he raved on and on about it. And the one he was raving on and on and on about was the ES and S one. And uh, then in April, the counties have another, what they call a spring conference. This one was held up in Layton, Utah. And it was kind of interesting in, to me that uh, they held a public hearing for the public input on that on the same night that the big to-do dinner was and, you know, for elected officials and so on and so forth. I went down to that and members of my staff. There were no other county clerks there. Michael Cragen was there. Uh, Gary Herbert was there. Joe Demo was there. And as they took input from people, nearly, it had to be well over 90%, spoke in support of the es and &S Automark. Now the Automark is a very unique machine in that it takes the optically scanned ballot, but it takes a blank ballot and you put it in. The handicapped people then, uh, through devices, whether it's you know voice or touch, the machine marks that ballot for them and then it's put in with the rest of the ballots, and so you can't tell it. The handicapped people spoke for it. You know, there were some who started out in support of Diebold, and boy, those people really set up straight. And then they changed the S and S, and you know, it's kind of like this. Well, the next day, uh, I went up to Dana Latour in the where they were set up, and I put my arm around Dana, and I said, Dana, you are both good companies. I think that counties need to have the opportunity to decide for themselves which way to go. And she says, well, I understand your concerns, and I see where you're coming from. But she says, all those people who spoke there, 
last night. They were taken outside at the South Town Mall by es and s and told what to say there. And I thought, <laughs> I spent most of that day with Tim Canoose myself. You know, and this is what I'm dealing with. I went into the clerk meetings and I forced the lieutenant governor into giving counties the option. You know, I really made him squirm and finally he did. But then he closed every door when it came to the ES and S and the auto mark on me. Even after he told me and had met in meetings and that we were going that way and then he closed the door, I have to certify him. And he closed that door. Okay? So I can tell you on this April 20th meeting, and I can't confirm it because I don't know. I do know that Tim Canoost has always been a good friend and honest with me. And I do know that day in April, in those meetings in Layton, he was standing there when he got a call, and I could just see him fuming there, and he was dancing because I had told him all along, you don't hire lobbyists. And his people over him says, you need to hire lobbyists. And I says, these people know you, Tim. You keep it straight and down the road. And he was so upset when he got finished off from there. He says, I want to go in and tell those clerks something. I says, what do you want to tell them? I want to tell them what I think. And I says, talk to me about it. He says, well, this was my person over him. He says, he's telling me that an individual, now I'm telling you this is only hearsay, and I don't want you to take it any further than here. Okay? Because I'll deny it. He said to me, there's a fellow who approached, or my people approached a fellow, or somehow, I can't remember for sure how exact it happened, talked to the highest state official, wanted to be a lobbyist for ES and S. And that official says, you're wasting your time. We're going with Theobald. You know, I said, Tim, not worth it. You know, he, he wanted to pack up and go then. Go ahead. Black box voting got hold of, in which the governor said, I want to, to in order to sort this mess out, I want to um, go and check out black box voting. I want to look at some of these things for myself in order to determine what's been going on. So from that email, there appears to have not been a lot of communication between the lieutenant governor's office about his decision and about the machines, about um, Bruce Funk and, and uh, the um, examination of the machines. I don't think the governor had all of the information he could have had. And what, what was, um, he said he was going to follow up. What have you heard about that? I haven't. I, uh, people have sent thousands of emails to the governor, attorney general, lieutenant governor, Michael Cragen, my county commissioners, elected officials throughout the state, and they get put in one box. One back question back here. You know, it all comes back to one thing, and as far as I'm concerned, for Governor Huntsman, he said he's resigned his membership, but you know, he's so tied so deeply with the Council on Foreign Relations. He sold his soul. I call these people Esau's because they sold their soul for that little bowl of potty. And we're dealing in a circumstance that unless they are dealt with right, and that means that they're jerked out of there and just put in their place, uh, and, I, and whenever I say put in their place, they're sent back home and gotten clear out of circulation because you can just tell and feel that Governor Huntsman is not honest with we the people of Utah. And as far as I'm concerned, on the collection and giving out information on the way a voting system or the voting is going, there should be a 48-hour waiting period where we're accumulating information 
on a on a major voting uh, situation such as the presidency. As it comes to sundown, all of that information is accumulating from the from the east coast, and as it goes on to the west coast, you got four to five hours. Uh, it's influencing what's taking place as it goes down the road. And then you get into the time frame of Alaska and Hawaii, you know, which is another several hours added to it. That we're not having a true and honest voting system. And the way I see it, you know, for the money we're spending, we can buy an awful lot of pencils. <laughs> We can buy a pile of pencils, you know, and they, and, you know, I, I called up the uh, lieutenant governor's office uh, during this last runoff and expressing myself, and he was trying to go on, well, you can have fraud with your, with your paper and pencil. I said, yeah, if you people would be honest with yourselves, I said, we could eliminate a lot of this fraudulent doing, but I said it comes from inside. It's not from we the people. This whole thing is a cover up. This it's a travesty. I mean, I, I don't know. Go ahead. Um, I'm trying to get a better picture of this. Uh, looks like a hatchet job, almost a lynching. You mentioned a number of people flew down, so it sounds like a dozen or more people at this this bulk dive. Uh, uh, Diebold and the state of Utah seemed very arranged, very one-sided. Seemed like they were coming in to do a hatchet job. Could you give a little better um, idea? You said they flew down, and, and is that, is that yes, they flew down. And there, I had to go to Joycelyn again because I couldn't figure out how Joe Damon got to hold the Salt Lake Tribune so fast. And so, how did this word get there? And I said. Did they fly back together? Were they all together? And she researched it out and, and emailed me back and said they were flew down together in the governor's plane. So they conspired this whole, and I'm just, you know. <laughs> because if you watch very carefully, when, and Commissioner Hatch has talked about it in things afterwards, and then we're going to apply for some HAVA money to replace the 40000 that the county spends. So a, a clerk from Emory County checks out a machine, and that's worthy of getting on the Huntsman jet and, and with a dozen or more people and going down there for a, a big hatchet job. Yeah. You know what it is? It, the problem is that names and reputations become tied to these machines. And so if, you're, if these machines might have a, a fallibility or people find out that they can fail or can be hacked into, the, the people who have authorized the purchase of these machines now have their names and their reputations that they're going to have to defend along with the pur purchase of those machines. This happens everywhere, uh, not just in elections or governments. It happens in corporations. And, sure. and, uh, so is the state then going to go uh, statewide? With this deep old machine? You are already statewide. Yeah. You used it in the primary. Did you know that it went perfectly? I had the, an individual uh, from, from Arizona. And there you have to decide on Diebold. And Diebold is saying it went perfectly in Utah. Well, let me tell you something here. And I don't want to refer to which paper it is. <clears throat> there was one machine in Green River that we took out of service for a problem of, with printing. We have but since checked it out and is now fine. There were a few screen calibration problems. Now, what in the heck is a screen calibration problem on election day? Can you tell me what it is, somebody? If you have a screen calibration problem on this, what is it? That's exactly. You might think you're pushing it for Canada Day, and it's Canada B. Joycelyn, did they have all the doors open on the voting machines in the state of Utah? No, and I was told that they, all the doors were, had been 
Do you know where the printer is? Across the state. They were, in fact, taken off in Salt Lake County. I just learned from him that they were not in Emory County. And tell them how your door is yeah. functioning. Uh, let me give you a little background on this. I had to meet my attorney that day. I couldn't vote absent voter ballot because of what I know, how you can read. It's an optically scanned ballot and I, they could tell exactly how I voted. I couldn't do a provisional ballot at the poll because they'd know how I voted. So I came to Salt Lake and met with my attorney. He said, now you voted, didn't you? I said, no, I can't. He says, yes, you are. You're going to go back and vote. So he made sure that we went back and voted. We entered the poll somewhat after 7 o'clock that evening, and uh, I did vote on that machine. And I couldn't get it to do one thing. I'm not, like I said, I'm not a computer person. What happened to your card when you shoved it in? What did it say? Ballot canceled. So she has to take it back to the, the judge's election. They take it and rub it. We've had a number of these today. And so she brings it back and shoves it in there. And, you know, and I'm looking at her machine. And the door is closed. You can't even see that, what are that Cracker Jack magnifying glass they have underneath that? You couldn't even see that either. I says, these things need to be open to the public. I asked the judges of election, have these been this way all day? And they said, yeah. Oh, we had perfect. These doors cover the printout of your ballot. How are you supposed to verify your vote if the doors are closed and everyone's new to this system and they don't even know that First of all, that their ballot's being printed. Second of all, that they should check it. And third of all, that it's underneath this door that's closed. And, and even if they knew, you think they'd open up that door? Most people are cowed by equipment and whether they should be doing something, those doors should have been opened. That's just the bottom line. Um, my background as a CPA auditor, is there some type of, I mean, I see three ways that voting could be accurate. You can either test the machines before during the election or after the election. Is there an audit trail? Well, take Salt Lake County, how many machines do they have? Before would just be testing. During the election or after the election would be better. Do, do either of you know the audit trail to go through the electronic computer equipment? There's supposed to be a public testing, but you can't do a public testing on X number of machines that you have, for example, Salt Lake County. And so they'll do a random, I assume, I don't know. Do you know how they've done it? You can do a very small population, and you can get within 98 or 99 percent accuracy through statistical sampling. Do they do that? Are they going to do no. that during the election? As a matter of fact, that's what I was telling you earlier. Kathy Dobb and I had written a bill uh, and gave it to the legislature in, in January of this year to have our machines audited at a certain percent, have a committee set up to figure out exactly how the randomness was going to work and whether it should be we should be auditing machines or precincts or, or whatnot. That bill never even got out to a committee. It was quashed. It did get, uh, when it actually got written up and by the legislative office, all that it looked like was this committee that was it said nothing about the audit process that we had written, uh, how many of the machines should be, um, what percentage should be audited, uh, whether they, we had also stated that they should be audited at the precinct and the machine um, level. Anyways, it never got anywhere. And the, why do you think the reason for that is? Because this is a brand new system. They don't want to have or make any waves about it until it's been tried and tested and maybe not even then. So there is no testing of the electronic oh, data? Oh, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, there was a, a recount. There were, there were three races. The corporation not having audits? That's great. No. <laughs> and so here comes, here comes a recount in Salt Lake County. Um, and, you know, I started asking Salt Lake County back in a year ago, back in August, for their procedures of how they were going to run the elections with these new machines. And I'm talking about just procedures, office procedures, recount procedures, um, absentee ballot procedures. Internal controls. N nothing. I asked up through January, through March, 
He said, finally, by March, they said, well, we're just waiting now from Diebold to get information from them in order to finish up it and be able to come up with procedures, written procedures for the. So here it comes, uh, early voting. And I'm saying, where are your written procedures for early voting? Well, we don't have any. What are you doing? Uh, you know, how are you running this election? Well, we've got, we've got them running elections, which are essentially our democracy, you know, the seat of our democracy, and they're running it by the seat of their pants. This is what is happening here. So here comes a recount. They have no procedures in place. So what do they do? You're a CPA and auditor. All they did was a reconciliation procedure. They just went back and looked at the poll books, um, you know, how many people were absentee, got the same numbers, uh, and then they shoved the memory cards So back they just in. looked at totals? Absolutely. Yeah, that is not good. a recount. Well, and see, to do that, to do a random run-through would be very simple. I mean, we're not talking about a big expanse. Right. I mean, you could even randomly select voters as they went through the polls, and that voter would be one of your, that would be in your test population. They wouldn't necessarily know that, and it could be done at each one of the precincts, and it would be very inexpensive to do it. Well, That's what happened in Ohio. You're, you're, you're saying pick particular voters and have their votes audited? You aren't supposed to know what county voters. Well, if you don't do that, you don't, you, then there's no way to know. It's just all going through a big system and there's no... Right, so you'd have to decide, well, are we going to, to audit all the votes on, on a machine, on a, you know, all the votes on one machine? Are we going to audit all the votes in a particular precinct? Um, you know, that's the level that we're looking at, not not votes on a machine. You'd have to audit all of the votes on one machine or... or um, well, and you could you could randomly select machines from the precincts yes. and somebody could go in and audit those. Yes. And that would have a very high percentage of, of knowing that it was right or wrong. Exactly. But they're not doing that? No. Oh. I think the thing that needs to be, you need to watch and get people involved in is new legislation that's coming down the tube because you've got these interim committees that are writing these bills to, to fit the mold that, that the elected officials want it to fit, not the public. You know, They're writing legislation to the machines yeah. instead of to the process and to our, you know, our demand. Well, it it, it needs to be written to the accuracy of the yeah. process. Where's the pressure coming from? Well, I, I, I think the pressure is there. You, you got to have recounts, and how are you going to do it? You know, and so uh, the pressure, I think, came uh, probably initiated, you know, through Haba, you know, and, and Diebold, and I can't prove a thing of this, but I, I saw things manipulated to benefit them when it came to the voter verifiable auto paper trail or whatever they want to call it. You know, the legislation was being fit in place. The April 20th, I had Tim Knuse point out to me, there's Diebold's big money man. You know, and I'm thinking, we can't stop anything. I don't know where it comes from. You spoke earlier about an intentional hole in the software uh, that was found, it sounds like, very easily by uh, someone who really understood the machines and how they work. But it also sounds, I'd like both your answers on this, it was an intentional foregone conclusion that Diebold was going to get the account, even though these problems were found and addressed, made well, public. I'll well, speak to the foregone conclusion. ES&S told the state that they would have by the first of, was it the first of May or first of June, uh, their machines would be certified. On the 31st of May, the, the, the decision wasn't supposed to come out until the 10th of June, I believe. Uh, as to which machine was going to be picked, which system was going to be picked, whether it was going to be an ES&S uh, equipment system or, or Diebold. All of a sudden, on the 31st of May, one day before these machines were to receive their official federal certification, um, the lieutenant governor switches the date and says that they have picked Diebold because ES&S machines are not certified. That was one day prior. One day. Yes. <coughs> how, how about that? Those is is Diebold a German company? 
No, no, they're Ohio. They're, they're American. They're a public company. They do yeah. machines for banks. Yes, and this is a privately held corporation. Diebold is a publicly held. That's why they have a lot of stockholder lawsuits going on against them. <coughs> I was just wondering about the story behind the shirt. Okay. <laughs> it started several years ago when I uh, first ran for uh, clerk auditor. And uh, I was having a hard time coming up with a t-shirt, and so surely this one didn't fit me, but uh, it was I know Bruce Funk, uh, re-elect, vote for experience, clerk auditor. And so... You know, as I've looked at things, and I got one really strange email from a lady back east, and uh, the thing that's bothered me is there is nothing to galvanize, and, and we need something that, that brings this issue up. And she says, I hope Bruce Fink, F-I-N-K, becomes a household name. <laughs> and I thought... You know, it's not about me. You know, we talk about what can one person do. You know, we, we talk about elections, and I can't change anything. And I think about I was one person. You know, I don't look at me as some heroic thing who done something. I done what I needed to do knowing it was right. But if, in turn, you're wearing that, somebody's going to ask you, what about that? So now they read. I know Bruce Funk, but if you read the voice in there, it says, A Voice for America Against Hackable Voting Equipment. Control your vote. That's not what I originally had. I, I had in there a voice for America against corporations who want to control your vote. You see why I had to change it? <laughs> because black box folks told me that they have gone through all the files in the state under grandma request, and there was a memo in there, my Diebold attorney trying to find something that's, that they could get me for slander, and I'm thinking, I've got to change that. Let me tell you how I classify you. You're a sheepdog. <laughs> <laughs> and they are very critical in protecting the flock. Yeah. They're very critical in protecting the flock. They will fight the wolf, coyote, and they will try to keep the, the flock grouped together. If, if you've ever worked any cattle with a, with a good dog, they make all the difference in the world. Yeah. This is the sheep. And, and you're a sheepdog. <laughs> you're willing to bark whenever it needs to be done. I have to tell you one short one real fast. Nine, we're going long here, and I understand if you need to leave, so anytime you do. When I first became county clerk, we had the courts as part of the, the county clerk. And the courts demanded all this paperwork and cases filed and all this stuff. I went to the legislator, you know, and I'm, I'm just a young pup then. You know, 23 years ago, I can't remember that far back. But I went and raised heck on the the uh, court administrator's office and and uh, to the legislators. And uh, later, the, the court administrator resigned. But uh, during the do uh, the conversation with the legislator in that committee, he said, caught me afterwards, and he said, "You're kind of like a dog. You go around to all these bushes. You go." Whoosh, Squirting on each one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I I am used to taking all kinds of abuse and and that I told my wife I kept quiet from her a lot of this stuff what I was doing but when I knew I had, finally had to do what I was going to do I said uh, I want you to know something I'm going to be known for good and bad you want know a response was. I'll bet mostly bad. <laughs> and then I let her sit down and read over the internet about Ion Sancho and what they were doing to him. And I said, 
that's what I'm going to go through. Can you go through it with me? And she said, yeah. And she's been a 100% supporter. Or I couldn't do that. So I'm going to set up a website called brucefunk.com, make T-shirts available, and let's get them out there. If organizations want to get them in quantities, we'll do something. I think we need to get them across the United States. We're going to take the proceeds and use them like to go into Arizona where he's, if he can get this meeting set up for next Tuesday, they want to fly me down because they don't believe the crap they're being told by their state people. You can reach me at I know Bruce Funk at yahoo.com. Nothing hard to remember about that. Just remember yahoo.com. Now, I get a lot of emails, and I don't get much time because I'm trying to carve out a living because I don't have one now. You know, that went away with what they done. Go ahead. Uh, Joycelyn asked me that, too. <laughs> Four years ago, it, it was a tough one. And uh, I had taken a lot of flack because of things that I'd done with people, uh, people who had bought using the county's name and turned around and sold things and no sales tax collected and things were pretty tough and they were pretty out after me. But I knew I needed to stay. I went through that election because my office staff would not stay. And I knew at that time, you know, I needed to stay for that four years. And at the end of this term, I wanted to retire. And uh, I have got a good person from my office who won't talk to me now because they, have, they think that I've created this monster. You know, no public trust, 17% uh, turnout on the primary. People aren't voting, you know. People I dearly love and care about don't talk to me. But no, I, I've i kind of given that idea up, and, uh, you know, she is a better person for that job than I am at this time. So I respect that. <laughs> Will she be the sheepdog or the cow dog? No. As none of your county clerks throughout your state are, I'm sad to say. And I held them in the highest esteem. And I'm still trying to hang on to that dream. So I love and appreciate this great country. And the vote is the most sacred thing to me. And I'm going to stay with this cause. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of guts. And I just want to walk away from it. <laughs> so I appreciate it and appreciate your support. Uh, I've been following this for a long time. The most amazing thing that I found out about this whole thing is a, a man named Michael Ian Shamos, he's one of the, t the top scientists that they're going to in the country right now, and he's been involved in this for a long time. In 1988, he was in a report talking about the uh, punch card machines that we use. I've been really interested to know how they work. Uh, the tabulator that tabulates your punch cards is actually, it's a software-driven computer, which can be programmed through radio. And it's programmed by one guy in Utah, his name is Lloyd Carr. And, I mean, is that safe? If is somebody walks up to a white car and says, hey, do you want a few bucks? Uh, can you, do you think you can do something for me? I mean, is this safe? I don't know if you remember the last article that quoted uh, Lloyd Carr. In fact, it was the Salt Lake Tribune editor out in Washington, D.C. I said, why don't you talk to Lloyd? Because I had talked to Lloyd. Lloyd says, I can't print the optical uh, provisional ballots and absent voter ballots. I said, why? I, he says, I have to buy a $250,000 machine because you can't have the crease on one of those ovals that we won't read it, this, this, and this. And he says, if you look at these ballots that were used in Farmington and that, they don't match up on the front and back, and they're telling the county clerks you can go to a local printer and have them made. What had happened in Ohio when those went to count the absent voter ballots, 15,000? They couldn't run them through the, the scanner. You know, they had, actually ended up having people punch them in on the touch screen. And do you know that those memory cards were delivered back by tack yellow cab drivers? I found that out today. That was Michael View, who used to be in charge yeah. of the elections in Salt Lake County. 
And, and Blackwell, this guy who's the Catherine Harris of, of uh, Ohio, is uh, has to cast the deciding vote on whether he gets to keep his job. Yeah. Uh, we have exported out of Salt Lake County two previous. Thad Hall has a new job with the EAC, uh, who who was a shill around here. Uh, I'm sorry, but I didn't call people a shill, but this guy, uh, he was all for getting rid of paper ballots at the hearings, and now all of a sudden, uh, now that we have the Diebold machines, oh, I don't have anything against paper ballots. You know, uh, the, the only people that they hire or talk to are pro-evil uh, yeah. people. Yeah. Let me say in closing that this thing that we're involved in, and I say you are because I can't do it, Joycelyn can't do it, it goes back to the people themselves. You know, uh, in the last interim committee meeting, uh, Michael Craig and those legislators asked him, well, when our constituents ask us, well, what about the problems with these machines, what do we tell them? Do you remember what he said? This is we'll refer him back to us. I'm thinking you guys don't have only one municipal election behind you at the time, you know, and, and there's these major concerns. This thing is huge across the United States, all kinds of organizations. And Utah is on the map, just as the video showed. This is where it was found. And we have to stand up and keep that. They're looking to see what Utah is going to do. And are we going to lay over and play dead? That's what I, I feel like almost is happening. <laughs> we should have been meeting in Rice Eccles Stadium tonight and it jam packed. Yeah. But I'm willing, Joycelyn is willing, to go anywhere, anytime. And if we can, I'll cover my own expenses, whatever we can. It's that important. So I appreciate it, Clark, and, and the evening and and the opportunity of meeting you and, and hope this thing, you don't let it drop. It's a ball that, that I've picked up and put out there. I can't pack it. Thank you.